One other thing I just need to remind you of, uh, if you get the church e-news, you will have seen it in there. But if you would like to have a look at the latest tweaking of the proposed plans for the development over the road, then uh, Derek Wilson will be with uh, colour A3 copies of plans in the training room immediately following the service. And again, 4.30 to 5 before the evening service tonight. So training room immediately following the service if you want to go and have a look. And Derek would love to hear your responses. We're collating different uh, reactions and responses. So I recommend and encourage you to do that. Okie dokie. So here we are in week four of our series, Not All Superheroes Wear Capes. This week, I've had the, it's been very gratifying to hear a couple of people actually mention uh, some of the def, part of the definition of what we've decided it means to be a hero, which is like, good. It's like the teacher in me goes, that's great, people are getting it. Um, but in case it's not quite in your head yet, we, we started out this series by saying that heroes are people who act willingly and intentionally to meet a need of an individual or a community at often great personal cost and without a moment's thought to uh, gain or recompense. So that's the, the, the definition of a hero that we're working on. And we, we saw early on, and we'll say again and again, that Jesus is the ultimate hero, according to that definition. And we've seen then, in, in a, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the fact that heroes are people who dream of home, the home that is coming, but also the home that Jesus has already brought to us in small ways. And last week we said heroes are people who live and breathe justice. And this week and next week, as we finish off, we're going to talk about one final characteristic of what makes a hero, and it's simply this. Heroes make it happen. We can talk nice sermons and great theology and um, inspiring uh, philosophy and, um, and um, emotive language, but at the end of the day, heroes make it happen. Um, if you haven't got along yet to a 5pm or an evening service in this series, you're really welcome to do so tonight because what we've been doing in that space is actually getting some local heroes from this congregation to tell stories of how um, something heroic that happened in their life has changed them and also how it's changed their experience of God. So we've got one more of those tonight. I think a few people will be choosing to come there this evening and that's Joyce Arnott. She's going to tell us a little bit of a story. They've been great. Uh, the ones that we've heard there. But the stories in the morning service as well, only this, these ones aren't personal to people in our community, but the story I want to tell you today, I read actually just recently in a book written by Scott Higgins, who uh, is very active in the, in the world of uh, Christian justice issues, and uh, he, he wrote a book all about how we can use our voices powerfully. And he tells this true story. It's the story of Oscar Romero, on the February the 23rd in 1977, Oscar Romero was uh, installed, I think that's the word, as Archbishop, Catholic Archbishop in El Salvador, uh, one of the smallest, I think the smallest and most densely populated uh, country in Central America. Now, because that's not part of our tradition, archbishops, etc., we probably just need to remind ourselves that to, to, an archbishop has incredible power. There's a lot of power in that space, and in this case, um, this, his powerful position was actually over the entire country of El Salvador. Now, at first, people were not happy about this appointment, most people. Not everyone. The oppressive and repressive government was very happy because Romero had a bit of a reputation for very conservative theology and politics, so they thought it was a safe appointment. But the general people, the bulk of the people, and the more reform-minded priests were not happy about this at all because they knew Romero would have great power and they didn't expect that he would use it well. But you can probably guess that um, that's not how the story is going to go, otherwise I might not be telling it this morning. He actually surprised everyone, this archbishop. You see... Two things happened, really. As an everyday priest, so, you know, a parish priest, he'd spent a lot of time before he got promoted up the ranks amongst uh, groups of people that were called campesinos. So they were subsistence farmers, people who only just managed and oftentimes didn't manage to produce enough food to keep themselves and their families alive. People whose children died for want of basic, basic medical uh, care. People who were beaten, raped and murdered if they dare suggest that there was something unjust about the way they and their families were being treated. So he'd actually spent his parish priest days amongst people that lived life like that. That shaped him. 
quietly, perhaps without him even realising. And then two weeks after he became Archbishop, a really good friend of his called Rutilio Grande was murdered by the paramilitary. And he was murdered by the paramilitary because he'd been trying to help these campesinos organise themselves into little self-reliance groups um, so that they could actually figure out how to get on with life without being reliant on the, the wealthy power of the few. So he'd been doing that and he got uh, killed by the paramilitary for doing that. And Ramiro was horrified at his friend's death. So he's archbishop, he uses his power to say to the government, you've got to investigate this, this isn't right. He was murdered. There was nothing accidental or natural about his death. But his request was politely and pointedly ignored again and again and again and again. So Archbishop Romero, he got vocal. And he used Sunday masses. He used public speeches. He used to record Sunday sermons that were then broadcast on the radio. He used those. He used public and private letters to highlight and call out the exploitation of the poor in his country and the violence that was used against any who tried to oppose that injustice. He turned down invitations to officiate at government events or even just to turn up at them because he knew the government would use that to say, well, the archbishop's here. You know, he, he supports us. And when Romero realised that no amount of pressure, he was constantly trying to put pressure on the government to, to investigate the murders and the beatings and the rapes that happened, when he realised that no amount of pressure was going to make them investigate those things, he actually set up um, an investigative tribunal. He just established a new one. And people could bring their cases there and, and at least have a voice, at least have their cases um, exposed um, and the crimes exposed in that place, which caused quite a quite an issue <laughs> um, for the wealthy, uh, oppressive few. On May the 24th, 1980, just over three years, just three years and a couple of months after he was installed as Archbishop, he was actually shot dead while preaching during Mass. And the record of his sermon that he was preaching at the time, the last words that he spoke were these. He said, he had just said... We know that every effort to improve society, above all when society is so full of injustice and sin, and sin, every effort, is an effort that God blesses, that God wants, that God demands of us. Bang! Romero made it happen. It cost him his life. Here's another story. This one's from the Bible, and it's from uh, the book of Proverbs, not kind of a book you associate necessarily with stories, but they are in there. But the book of Proverbs is really a collection of quite exquisite little pieces of poetry that use evocative language, and they use um, a, a poetic technique called parallelism. So they're often in, in little uh, two parts, each of the, the Proverbs, each of the statements, and the first part says something, and the second part intensifies and clarifies what has been said in the first part. So it's a, it's a book of short sayings. They're crisp, they're succinct, and they offer insight, or sometimes they make an observation, or they give a piece of advice. And the important thing to know about the Proverbs is that all of that, the, the insight, the observation, the piece of advice, it's usually around a commonly held truth. So something that people in community commonly accept is true. So I want to tell you this story right from the end of, of uh, Proverbs. It's another story about the responsibility that those with power have to use it well. Responsibility that Romero understood. Okay, so the story is actually called The Sayings of King Lemuel. But they are actually the sayings of his mum. Things that uh, his mum said to him. You see, King Lemuel like so many kings in ancient history and probably so many kings in less ancient history, um, he, he wasn't using his power well and this king's mum was worried about how he was behaving. So I'm going to read it to you. Let's have a look. Proverbs 31, 1 to 9. The sayings of King Lemuel contain this message which his mother taught him. Sayings of King Lemuel's mum. O oh, my son, O oh, son of my womb, O oh, son of my vows, do not waste your strength on women, on those who ruin kings. Is that where it ends there? Yeah, look at that. 
It is not for kings, O Lemuel, to guzzle wine. Rulers should not crave alcohol, for if they drink, they may forget the law and not give justice to the oppressed. Alcohol is for the dying, and wine is for those in bitter distress. I see the eyebrows already. Let them drink to forget their poverty, it gets worse, and remember their troubles no more. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Ensure justice for those being crushed. Yes, speak up for the poor and helpless and see they get justice. Okay, so we're going to see if we can understand the gist of what King Lemuel's mum was telling him. In the first five verses, you've got them there in front of you, I'll refer back to them in a minute. She, she starts by saying, son. But I actually want you to think differently. If you're a woman here today, hear daughter. And she's really saying, son, daughter, anyone with power, anyone with power, don't spend your strength unwisely. Now, there's a, that word there, strength, English word strength, we think we understand what it means, but there's actually a whole pile behind that word in this, in this particular story. So the word strength is really a ref reference to good character, so don't spend your good character unwisely, or noble character, and it's also a reference to, to your energy or focus. So it's like King Lemuel's mum was saying, don't spend your good, noble character, and don't let your attention be absorbed and all your energy get used up in the wrong things. That's what she was saying. And in this case, she's quite um, clear with her boy where she thinks he's doing going wrong there. And she's saying to him, don't waste your good and noble character and, and your focus on sex, but a specific sort of sex. She wasn't worried about sex in general. It was the type of sex her boy was having that upset this mama. She's saying, don't be wasting your time on sex without loyal relationship, without dignity, without respect. And she also says, and don't add to that by wasting your good character on drinking to get drunk. She said, both those things, inappropriate sex and drinking to get drunk, they're just going to impair your judgment and your good character and they're going to exhaust you and occupy your mind, so there's no space in your head and heart for matters of justice. And in fact, if you give yourself to these two things, there is a huge, huge risk that you will not use your power well. You will, in fact, use your power badly. So that was the first tip of this mum to her son. Don't spend your good character on the wrong things, and don't waste your energy on the wrong focus. And in this case, she was specific with him about some things where she thought he was messing up. And then in the next um, verses, we read, uh, so verses 6 to 9, we, it goes a bit more positive there. So, so she's saying, don't, don't, don't. And then she starts to say, but do these things, boy. Do these things instead. So let's hear these bits. Son, daughter, <laughs> any of you with power, give comfort to the people who need it and focus your attention and your voice on behalf of those whose lives are shaped by injustice. She actually says these words. We read them just earlier. Alcohol is for the dying and wine for those in bitter distress. Let them drink to forget their poverty and remember their troubles no more. It probably ought to raise an eyebrow or two. I see, I see that it did earlier, but it's interesting, isn't it? You know, it's one thing to say, hey, enjoy a glass of red wine or a nice cold beer, but quite, enough, uh, quite another thing to seem to be encouraging people to drink as a stress management tool. Okay, you know, that feels like and actually is very dangerous, um, especially, especially when you understand and appreciate that alcoholism is a huge factor in the lives of people who, whose lives are shaped by injustice. It's often a massive issue in that space. And I guess I want to stop here and say right now, if your life is shaped by alcoholism because you drink too much, or because someone you're in relationship with drinks too much, I, I can see how these verses might feel offensive. Or maybe, for some of you, if you drink too much, it might sound like permission. And for others who suffer at the hand of someone who drinks too much, it might sound like flippant, like, my goodness, nobody seems to realise what is happening here. And I, I want to say that's not what these verses are about, and we'll get to what they are about. And I want to say clearly that all relationship-breaking abuse breaks God's heart and ought to break ours. I reckon King Lemuel's mum knew that. So what is going on with the advice that King Lemuel's mum gives? 
Well, three things. Firstly, we've got to remember that the culture that this story takes place in was a culture where it was absolutely normal for everyone, even children, <laughs> um, watered down, but to drink something alcoholic every day. Abstinence was probably almost unheard of. Um, not to say they didn't have problems with alcoholism, but it, it's just the way the culture was. Secondly, we've got to look at the motivation behind uh, what the king's mum says here. So think about this for a minute. She's watching her boy and she sees that he is drinking and just forgetting. But he's not drinking to forget misery. He's the king. He's got everything going on for him. He's not drinking to forget misery. He was drinking and forgetting his responsibility. That's what really upset her. He was the king. And he had the power and the mandate to ensure that justice was being done. But the people he was responsible for, they were left in very real misery without comfort while he was getting drunk and forgetting. You know, if anyone needed to drink to forget, it was these people, not him. His people were desperate for comfort and in dire need of someone to focus attention on them and their plight. So when Lemuel's mum says, give these people your wine, she's using the wine um, as both a call to give the people genuine comfort, and I think she's using it as a symbol of justice too. If anyone needs the wine, son, it's them, not you. But she's saying that to highlight a third thing. The king's mum wants her to see that he doesn't need the wine to forget misery. The people do, but only because he is not acting justly. The people need comfort because he is not using his power well. She says these words to him, speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. Ensure justice for those being crushed. Speak up for the poor and helpless and see they get justice. So Lemuel's mum told him, use your power and authority wisely. Stop chasing comfort, boy, she says. Comfort that's actually giving away your good character and your focus and your strength and keeping you from your responsibility. Start giving comfort to those in need. That's represented in that, the, the words about the wine. Start speaking out for their right to live lives that are not determined by injustice so they won't need the wine to forget. Can you see the two things of the comfort and the actually taking action to do something about it so they're not in need of that comfort in the way that they are at the moment? She's saying to him, speak words that expose and then basically restrain and even punish the cheating and the lying and the stealing and the violence that so often hurts those who are already poor. They're already marginalised. They're already living lives that, quite honestly, you and I would think that's no life. These people already in that circumstance were getting injustice heaped upon injustice. And I can just hear her saying, make it happen, Lemuel. Make it happen. And I think that Archbishop Romero would have liked Lemuel's mum very much. And I'm sure Jesus loves her and her make it happen advice to her boy. And I'm sure of this because of what we've been learning over these last few weeks. I'm sure of this because of the story of God's own preoccupation with restorative justice. Remember we had the story of the babies in the stream last week? Justice is more than just benevolence, which is important, we learned. But it's more than just doing kind things to people who, have felt, who are in a difficult situation. Justice is much more than retribution. And it's even more than just an equal distribution. Restorative justice is justice that liberates all people and all of creation to the relationships and the meaningful community that we are designed for. That's what God's restorative justice is. And last week, we traced the story of that uh, through the Bible story. And we saw that, like the prophets had done, Jesus gave a lot of attention to justice for three groups, for the poor and widowed and orphaned. But Jesus added 
expectation of that same sort of justice that the prophets had talked about for other groups in society, for, for other people who were exploited or excluded or marginalised. So if you recall, in Jesus' day, he added to the widows and the, and the orphan and the poor women, slaves, people with disabilities, people who were demon-possessed, People who were considered untouchable, which was um, menstruating women or shepherds, anyone who touched, whose work involved uh, touching dead animals, they were untouchable. Uh, people who were social pariahs in the sense of tax collectors. Jesus included his understanding of restorative justice very clearly to include those groups, but... He was doing more than that. I don't know that we saw it while he was here on earth. But after Jesus' death and resurrection, people realised that the category that Jesus had expanded from the poor and the widow and the orphaned was actually even broader. It wasn't just women and people with disabilities and the other categories that Jesus clearly addressed. People realised that God had acted so that all of humankind and all of creation can be liberated from injustice. Even, even the injustice we've done ourselves. It was huge what Jesus was doing. And you can see the story how little bits of justice have been, uh, justice for these people, justice for these people, justice for these people. And then Jesus, justice for all humankind and for all of God's beautiful creation. And so, you know, as local gatherings of Jesus followers, each church and the church as a whole has always had this mandate to be a community that stands and speaks and acts for restorative justice in the name of Jesus. We, we've got this mandate to be a community that makes it happen. That's what people who follow Jesus do. Jesus following heroes make it happen. And, you know, sometimes that's in huge very public, history-changing ways, like Martin Luther King and Archbishop Romero. And uh, more recently, let's come closer to home and, and closer in time, uh, more recently the way that organisations like Baptist World Aid Australia and local churches and other agencies have put incredible pressure on governments and corporations so that more of the, the, the chocolate, the coffee, the clothing, the electrical goods that we use have been uh, arrived in our shops and then in our homes with um, sus sustainably but also fairly uh, produced. There's a, there's a way to go on that, but we mustn't lose sight of the fact that it's been uh, organisations like Baptist World Aid Australia and, and Christians and churches joining them that have made that big history-changing change. So heroes make it happen, sometimes, as I say, in those big ways. I mean, one we've been involved in recently is uh, the, uh, pressuring the government to make changes with regards to uh, facilities for uh, people, men and women and children, who otherwise have to live with domestic violence, it's something we were involved in last year. And the government have changed, uh, begun changing their laws because we, we use our voice. They're big ways. But, you know, heroes can sometimes make it happen in much less public, but I want to argue, no less history-changing ways. You and I can be involved in that. And I see already how this is happening in our church family. One of the ways we were highlighting over this last couple of weeks, I see it happening when people from this church family learn how to get alongside someone how to establish a friendship with a purpose through the community mentoring program we call COACH. And you must never underestimate, I've seen it again and again in my years of pastoring and just in my years of being alive, <laughs> just getting to be a few now. You make a change, you get alongside someone and help them with some personal goals to make a change. And that is like, it's not a pebble in a pond, it's like dropping a boulder in a pond. <laughs> you, you change things for the, the people involved in that time, but for generations to come. It takes that quiet getting alongside someone often to actually make a change that does alter history. It's not going to probably ever be preached about, like Martin Luther King and Romero, but it will change history for generations to come. So heroes can make it happen in these very small ways as well, but no less important, no less history-changing. So when we make it happen... When we take action in Jesus' name that helps people and creation flourish, then I want to say that that is the story of God's creative, uh, restorative justice playing out. Whenever you do that in the smallest of ways, 
or whether we join our voices to make something happen in some huge, uh, clearly history-changing ways. So, I want to ask you some questions before I invite uh, Simon to the platform to talk a little more about coach. Just imagine for a moment that King Lemuel's mum was your mum and that you were a person of power, which we each are. You can be her son, her daughter. You're a person of power. What might she be saying to you and I about how we are using our strength or spending our character, using our power or focusing our energy? Maybe it is being misspent on alcohol and sex, as she talked to her boy about. But it might be something else. It might be work, it might be status, it might be how the house looks, it might be bitterness. If she was your mum, what might she want to have words with you about where you're spending your good character and your focus? Just take a moment to think about that. Okay, and then what about the, the, the second part of what she said to her boy? If Lemuel's mum was your mum, what might she be telling you to give your strength and your good character and your voice to? Where does our community need us to be a voice calling for justice? Maybe make it more personal than that. Who needs your voice? You know, there is hero work for us to do together. I think that's exciting. And uh, it's, it's not rocket science. It's kind of just the way we live when we personally know the restoration of God's love in our lives. It's a natural outworking of having that gift, that transformation in our own lives. So my question for you as Simon comes up to the platform is, how are you making it happen?